Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. The Greek people suffered mightily during their three years of Axis occupation. From 1941 to 1944, Greece was a nation in name only, as neither the ally-supported free government in Cairo, nor the Axis puppet regime in Athens commanded the loyalty of the majority. The Greeks were cut off from the outside world, and rudderless. And in this chaos, the Greeks had time to think what a free Greece would be – a monarchy, a republic, or a glorious workers' paradise. But the future of Greece would not be decided with ballots and slogans, but with bullets and slaughter. In this episode, we will examine the bedlam visited on Greece by the Allied victory, and learn how the British came to use their military might to intervene in the Greek Civil War. Before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to highlight the sponsor of today's video, Star Trek Fleet Command, a free-to-play mobile game for iOS and Android that lets you interact with the various iconic characters from Star Trek The Next Generation, the original series, and other important entries into the franchise. Choose a faction and start engaging with various storylines via the mission system, and enjoy real-time combat and exploration in a vast and interesting galaxy. An exciting new in-game story arc is now launching alongside a new Paramount Plus show, Strange New Worlds. Players can interact with the show via weekly episodic missions and fill out their crews with officers like Captain Christopher Pike and Science Officer Spock. New players don't need to feel left out either, as the holodeck feature allows them to explore past missions and story arcs while still enjoying the constantly evolving main campaign with new abilities, enemies, and secrets lurking in deep space. Start your captaincy and explore the Strange New Worlds update by heading over to the link in the video description and download the game now for free on iOS and Android devices. In the chaos created by the Axis occupation and the collapse of the Greek government, the most powerful political force was the Communist Greek Party, or Kappa Kappa Epsilon, which came under the leadership of Georgios Siados following the imprisonment of its previous head, Nikos Zakariadis, in Dachau. The National Liberation Front, or EAM, was founded under Kappa Kappa Epsilon direction in September of 1941, creating the Greek People's Liberation Army, or ELAS, the following December. The combined EAM ELAS would begin operations in spring of 1942 demanding its members do something completely foreign to the individualistic Greeks, who were long suspicious of organized authority thanks to centuries of foreign misrule. The Eamalas demanded total and unquestioning obedience, their promotion of unity and purpose the main driver for their prominence in the underground movement. But prominence did not mean cohesion, and the Eam Elas would find itself in conflict with not only the Axis occupiers, but other resistance movements as they jockeyed for political dominance in the coming liberation. The Greeks did not fight alone, however. Their defeat of Italy's invasion brought them much support from Britain, who until that point was largely fighting alone against the Axis. British troops were sent to the Mediterranean in March of 1941. Close behind these boots on the ground were spies in the shadows. Agents of MI6 made contact with Greek partisans. MI6's activities were soon absorbed into the wider Special Operations Executive, or SOE, the League of Gentlemen Spies that included the late Sir Christopher Lee, among others. But with the intervention of the Nazis and the expulsion of the Allies and the Greek government, the SOE's role in Greece would intensify with a campaign of sabotage by both British and Greek elements under SOE direction. These efforts were impeded by the Greek resistance itself, whose ideological infighting cast the SOE as the unwilling referee in their internal conflict. Outside this struggle, however, the Greeks proved keen intelligence gatherers, and together the British and Greeks were able to send substantial reports on the growing unrest in the Greek population and the unpopularity of both the Allied-approved Free Greek Government in Cairo and the Axis puppet regime. As the Allied invasion of Sicily in 1943 drew near, the SOE went to ground 
focusing on arming and training their testy charges and scaling back operations. With Germany on the ropes in 1944, an Allied victory seemed more imminent by the day. The Ayam Elas had only grown in power and influence throughout the occupation, drawing worried glances from their British comrades. Behind closed doors, the British agreed to not allow Greece to fall into the hands of the Reds. And with the Placa Agreement of February 1944, the British finally brokered a ceasefire among the squabbling Greek resistance organizations. The Aom Elas requested that a provisional committee be formed to liaise with the Free Greek Government, and that a single Greek underground army be formed, assumedly by them. Both requests were firmly rejected. Things were little better for the British-backed Greeks exiled to Cairo. Winston Churchill had long put his weight behind the Greek monarchist faction, which quickly found itself in turmoil when their chosen ruler, King Georgius II, refused to allow a regency government to be installed in his name when the country was retaken. The Free Greek Cabinet insisted on a regency, but with Churchill's backing, Georgius dug his heels in. The Eamalas looked on this chaos with hungry eyes. The Reds smelled blood in the water, as the Brits' chosen leader frustrated his own camp. The following month, the Eam inaugurated civil war, attacking the National and Social Liberation Party and killing their leader. This act was condemned by the newly installed Greek Prime Minister in exile, Georgios Papandreou, who accused the Greek Communists of trying to kill their way to a one-party state. Not long after, the Soviet delegation met with their ideological brethren, and in a surprise move, Georgios Siados joined the Papandreou government. This was in line with how Papandreou had opened his premiership with a call for national unity, and he set about bringing members of all the resistance groups together to form a united Greek government. Though Papandreou's messaging stressed unity and cooperation for all Greeks, it was clear his words were directed squarely at the Aeam Elas. May of 1944 would see the disparate resistance groups and government in exile come together and create the Lebanon Charter, ratified on the 20th of that month. The patchwork Greek organizations agreed to create a new, unified government, with all their interests represented, to hold and honor the results of a parliamentary election, and to hold a referendum on whether to bring back King Georgius II back to Greece as a monarch. All this Papandreou hoped to accomplish with British military backing. The British were in a prime position to control Greek liberation. Not only did they have the SOE advising and participating in the underground, but resistance groups from all ends of the political spectrum were supplied with British arms, and the free Greek government was in British Egypt. In summer 1944, the modestly named Operation Mana was laid out by Winston Churchill the blueprint for a British liberation of Greece. Meanwhile, the Aeam Elas went on a new offensive, meeting both Axis soldiers and the Quisling security battalions in pitched battles. The Aeam Elas were particularly vicious in the Peloponnese, where they hunted accused collaborators in the tune of 1,800 alleged killings. The British altered Operation Mana in response, splitting their forces to send an element to establish order in the Peloponnesian killing grounds. The Aeam continued to keep everyone on their toes by signing new agreements with Papandreou to allow Operation Mana to proceed. The sudden shift from violence to diplomacy confused many Greek communist fighters on the ground, but the communist leaders were more pragmatic, shaking hands with Papandreou while keeping a weather eye on the shoreline. That same shoreline filled with British commandos and their Greek allies on September 25th, when a combined force captured the port of Patras. Axis control of Greece was not long for the world, and the Nazis went into a full retreat on October 12th. The main British force dropped anchor off the Greek coast the very next day, and the 23rd Armored Brigade of the British Army drove into Athens October 14th. 
Papandreou arrived in the Greek capital on the 18th and was immediately faced with a challenge. The Aeam Elas controlled most of the country, though not the capital of Athens, and the left wing of his patchwork coalition howled for the punishment of collaborators. Add to this the total collapse of the Greek economy and the pressing need to disarm the partisans so the new government could assert control, and Papandreou was less the bold leader of a liberated nation and more the latest steward of a lit powder keg. He turned to the British to blow out the fuse. Papandreou and the Aeam aligned ministers in his cabinet entered marathon talks. Papandreou hoping to peacefully disarm a massive network of politically driven partisans who had enjoyed great success in resisting and driving out the Axis. Negotiations stalled out on December 2nd, 1944, and the Aeam contingent resigned from the government en masse. The very next day, crowds appeared in Athens to show support for the Aeam, and were fired on by police, who had forbidden the gathering in advance. 33 people were killed, and within an hour of the violence the secretary of the Greek Communist Party declared, henceforth Papandreou is an outlaw. Greece had re-inaugurated their civil war. It was time for the British to involve themselves. The 23rd Armoured was combined with the 2nd Parachute Brigade to form Arc Force and defend Athens. A full-scale offensive against the Aeam Elas was ordered, a matter of life and death per Churchill. The intervention was not popular with the war-weary British, and the Prime Minister had to defend Arc Force against a scathing political attack on the floor of the Commons. Churchill remained determined to crush communism in Greece in the face of any objection. And December 16th would see the Aeam Elas launch a three-pronged attack in Athens, an attack weakened by the defection of socialist elements of the movement who balked at fighting the Allies. The attack would accomplish little. The communists did take territory in the south of the city, territory the British cleared by the end of the month. And it was here that Arc Force stopped. Even Churchill knew the futility of trying to beat the communists in a brush war in the Greek countryside. The British were well and truly calling the tune of the Greek Civil War by this time, and it was Churchill, not Papandreou, who called a meeting of the Aeam and the Greek government for Christmas Day 1944. There was quick consensus that the Greek monarchy be restored under a regent, Archbishop Damaskinos of the Orthodox Church. The communists demanded between 40 to 50 percent of the peacetime parliament, as well as control of the justice and interior ministries. They also clamored again for punishment of all collaborators. These demands short-circuited the conference, but the communists did not pick their arms back up immediately. Churchill, finally browbeaten, did some browbeating of his own to convince King Georgius II to accept a regency government. Archbishop Damaskinos was installed on December 30th and accepted Papandreou's resignation, appointing hardline anti-communist general Nikolaos Plastiras to head the government. The communists, faced with the growing British military presence, decided that the time for fighting was done. The Aeam Elas retreated from their holdouts in Athens and the city of Preos, but not before executing masses of alleged collaborators and taking up to 35,000 civilians with them as human shields. 4,000 would not live to see their homes again. The communists and their captives slunk away. The twin atrocities of massacring supposed enemies and kidnapping hostages planting a seed of anti-communist hatred in the wider Greek public. A seed that would bloom and be plucked by future authoritarian regimes in Greece. But it wasn't long before anti-communists began carrying out crimes against the real and imagined Aeam Elas members, including extrajudicial killings and disappearances, intense surveillance, banishments to deserted islands, and the kidnapping and indoctrination of children, the last crime one that both sides shared a hand in. 
Arc Force stood down on January 8, 1945, and a legation from the AAM arrived to negotiate a truce with the British two days later. On January 15th, the AAM signed a formal armistice with the British, and all military operations ceased. The tired Tommies began packing up to go fight somewhere else, leaving the Greek communists to meet their countrymen and hammer out some kind of solution. The resulting Varkiza Agreement on February 12th saw the Aam Elas commit to demobilization and British-supervised disarmament, while the Plastiras government pledged elections within a year. With a tentative peace finally in place, Plastiras could turn his attention to repairing the ruined Greek economy and curtailing his right-wing fellow's desire for retaliation against the communists who had led the resistance for so long. Plastiras would eventually resign after a newspaper published a letter he had sent to the Nazis in an attempt to convince the Reich to broker a peace between Greece and fascist Italy. Admiral Petros Vulgaris would succeed Plastiras, and was forced to reckon with the appearance of vigilantes armed with weapons seized from the Aam Elas, who sought their own retribution against the communists, and who remained the very real power in many areas of the country. British soldiers would begin leaving Greece in large numbers the following April, beginning a years-long withdrawal that would officially end in 1950. This drawdown coincided with a year of mounting tensions, not only as the Greek vigilantes, who dubbed themselves the National Guard, postured and sought to satisfy their vendettas, but as the Greek communists began to regain some of their previous zeal, abandoning any notions of reconciliation and calling for a Greek-Soviet-style state. This was bolstered by the release of Nikos Zakariadis, the communist's previous leader from Dachau. Zakariadis resumed his former position, and it was under his watch that the third phase of the Greek Civil War would begin. On March 30th, 1946, a band of ex aam Elas partisans attacked the police station in the village of Litokoro at the base of Mount Olympus. Full-scale guerrilla war ensued, and the British watched Greece turn red. Yugoslavia would supply the Greek communists with everything from small arms to landmines to anti-aircraft weapons. But even as the British threw their hands up and left the security of the nation to the fledging Greek army in 1947, the Reds sorely lacked food and other basic necessities. It was here that Greece would receive a helping hand. The United States, eager not to let communism spread in the post-war world, sent the Greek government advisors and equipment that gave the Greek army a decisive advantage. The communists were placed on the back foot, and the Greek government pushed them back, culminating in a final battle on the Albanian border. The final communist redoubt in the Gramos mountain range fell after intense fighting in 1949, the defeated communists fleeing over the frontier. The Greek government declared victory, officially ending the Greek Civil War. Britain, and later the United States, intervened to ensure that the communists would not gain control of the nation. But what ensued was a period of division and ruin, while political schisms tore the Greek people apart. British military intervention, imperialist as it was, helped to liberate Greece from the Axis and lended some stability, but in the end, conflict was inevitable. Greece would ultimately prove to be yet another stage upon which the Cold War's ideological drama was performed. And though Britain and the United States would prevent the cradle of democracy from slipping behind the Iron Curtain, their intervention set the stage for the future installation of a right-wing military junta 20 years on. <laughs>